My name is Morris Panner, and I'm with a company called Ombra Health. And if you want to quickly get an analogy to frame where we fit in this ecosystem, if you think about the old analogy of miners and picks, we are not the glamorous miners digging for gold and creating the AI algorithms to diagnose things. We are providing some of the underlying tool sets that let people who do that, including various health systems, prosper and uh, really change in some ways both their financial and therapy profile. And I'll talk about how those come together. So unlike some of the other slides that start with a certain um, medical imaging focus, I'm really going to start with a little bit of a balance sheet focus. Because if you are inside of a healthcare system right now, I think for the last decade, you've learned to talk about the increasing amounts of imaging as a liability. People talk about how do we manage our storage? What do we do with it? We have too many servers. What are we going to do? Everything has now changed over the last couple of years, and that liability has really shifted into an enormous asset. And there is not a conversation today that we have with a healthcare system that does not involve this. And if you are involved in orchestrating any of the IT infrastructure, if you want to be working on something that the CEO and the CFO are thinking about, it's this, which is how to turn these hidden liabilities into assets. Because the other thing that's happening within healthcare systems, as everybody knows, is unbelievable margin compression and the very difficult world in which it is to deliver world-class care in a relatively declining reimbursement environment. So today's presentation is going to address all that. We're a, a cloud software platform that helps you share, exchange, view imaging in the cloud. We've been ranked number one by class for five years in a row. And we work with the six of the largest 10 healthcare systems and three of the four uh, top rated uh, children's hospitals. So why have people shifted to the cloud? And I'll line this up with what people are talking about in our world about business priorities for how to manage healthcare. Number one, you've invested a lot in some of the best clinicians in the world. Now, if you're talking about really complex care decisions, you're talking imaging. So you need a way to ingest and exchange imaging. And that CD is still off in the state of the art. This changes that and lets you do it in an automated way, whether it's from a web upload or whether it's from a, a, a node inside your network. The second thing you're going to need to do is cloud archiving. And it used to be something we could pitch to people as kind of a cost efficiency thing. Now I'm going to make the argument in this presentation, I think AWS would agree with me, that it is a strategic imperative. If you are not putting your data in the cloud, you'll be burnt. I mean, it is literally as if you are sitting at the table in the financial services world 10 or 15 years ago, and Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan was saying, we got to get our platform on the cloud to be competitive. And that was one of the key differentiators for the winners and losers in financial services over the last decade. The same will be true in healthcare. So the third point is tooling to analyze large amounts of data. Once you have this data, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is how do you use tools to start to know what you have. The average person inside a healthcare system not only doesn't really have a good way of accessing the imaging, but once you have a good way to access it, it's very difficult to rapidly explain what you have inside of your organization. And you probably have a lot of important stuff. And then finally, because this is a little bit different than any other industry in the world, we have to worry a lot about how to protect privacy and how to manage regulatory concerns. So everything we're going to talk about today is consistent with our highest values in the profession, the highest values of what you probably worry about almost as much as anything else, which is how to protect patients as you go through any change you make. So let me talk about this because one of the things we've thought a lot about is how do you marry up two things that used to be different? There used to be a world, and in fact, this conference is still, I would argue, a little bit of an artifact. You've got the life sciences people over in one room, and you've got the healthcare people over in the other. Those worlds are gradually, and I would say in some cases, violently merging. And right now, there's isolated instances where healthcare systems and pharma have aligned to do kind of creative projects. 
But I'm going to argue that over time, one of the things that's going to make precision medicine truly precise is that it's going to be that automatic feedback loop that you get the absolute best information to your patient at the point of care, and you are giving the insights back to the people who are going to then be able to commercialize that. And that's going to be a very virtuous circle. And one of the things that's going to distinguish everybody from uh, where you want to get care is are you getting the latest and greatest fastest? And that's why we have this circle. It starts with storage. Then you need to bring in image exchange, more in information into the system. You need to put value added services. And you can see that pushes both to the people who are trying to access you and brings it right back to the various stakeholders. And one of those stakeholders increasingly is going to be a patient. So as you think about this, start thinking about the world of uh, integrated uh, services. And one of the things that people are starting to think about and you need a platform to do is to be able to turn imaging into something that is useful as a consumable resource. It's been a clinical resource up till now. We all know that. And in fact, it's vexing as it is today to get somebody's priors. But now I'm going to sort of flip that on its head and I'm going to make a new matrix. I'm going to say I don't care about Morris's prior study anymore because I'm not treating Morris. I want to treat all the people who kind of look like Morris. So now what I want to do is look for biomarkers across a set of images that are uh, disparate. And I need to do that in a way that is respectful of Morris's privacy, but also gives me the opportunity that if I discover something and think something's interesting, I can bring it back and treat him. And all these multiple layers and multiple skills are something that the cloud and I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with AWS because the tool sets that they've uh, developed, often, by the way, ironically, one of the most powerful tool sets we use was originally developed to mask credit card numbers. So kind of coming back to that financial services transaction model, they were worried about exposing credit card data. We took that, worked with them, and now roll out something that lets you uh, go into uh, pixel level information and, and protect patient privacy, which is really cool. So as you think about this, think about how you're able to bring these things together and look at information on multiple planes. You're not just looking on priors, you're also looking at a different matrix, which is across your imaging data set. So as you start putting that into your mind, I'll show you what some of the industry leaders are doing today. Uh, right now. They're creating research packs. And what's interesting about that is we have major health systems coming to us and saying, we want to take every single image that we have, everything we've got, and we want to duplicate it. And now, I have never heard that before, because typically what I would hear from people is how fast can we, you know, image lifecycle manage away some of our data? We're being crushed with a storage burden, so forth and so on. No longer the case. The most agile organizations are saying what we need to do is create a research environment that is tied to our clinical environment. And at some basic level, one of the things that's happening is, and this is why maybe they split the rooms up, if you're a life sciences company today and you develop a brand new drug, what do you have? A massive burst of revenue. If you're the healthcare system and the provider who has to administer that therapy, does the reimbursement change? Does the insurance company suddenly say you should get a lot more? No. So every healthcare system, and then also the healthcare systems are saying, but we're the ones who kind of thought of it. We're the front of this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Why is this, you know, life is unfair. But this technology starts to equalize that and change that equation in a way that is pretty dramatic. So when you see these world leaders, what they're trying to do is create an environment where they can gain control of their IP, which means they have to get control of their data. So when you start thinking about this, if there's one thing you can do that's going to make an impression on the top level executive suite of your hospital, I find it difficult to get those conversations. And I go to plenty of healthcare conversations, and if I say, well, I'm going to help you manage packs better, I'm going to help you manage storage better, uh, people you know, say, can you get me a drink? You know, can you get away from me? If I say, I can help you actualize your data, I can help you turn that liability into an asset, I get conversations with anybody and they proactively reach out because this is top of mind. And what I think is kind of interesting about it is it's not that expensive to do in the cloud. That's what's changed this dynamic. One of the things that I think AWS has done that has changed the dynamic is they've started to bend the cost curve around infrastructure. 
And so companies like us are in kind of an odd spot in some ways. You know, my mom would arguably say to me, aren't you sort of telling them all your stuff and then they're gonna turn around and destroy you? And one of the questions is where do people fit in these various layers? And I think one thing Amazon has done a good job of is said, what is hard for you to do, which is infrastructure and the stuff that is benefits from massive scale. It really does. It just gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And it's hard for us to compete on, any of us in this room, to compete on that scale. But one of the things they're not great at is the tiny, narrow things that don't require scale. Because for exactly the same reason that you find scale hard, they find specialization hard. Because it's irritating and it's like, you know, there's four people who have to have it this way. We do a little more than four people, but what we do is we cater to that very individual uh, nature and that very individual set of requirements. So that's a big deal, and it's an advantage that you guys have as you look at vendors within this framework and within in, in this platform. So uh, when we talk about research now, we aren't just talking about, and what's cool about having been on, the, on this panel, I love being on this sort of virtual panel, with all the other companies that were on here, when you hear Arteris or Viz AI or Kieran Medical do their thing, what you're seeing is something that is sort of the next wave. It's super cool, it's enabled by all this kind of shift in infrastructure. It probably wouldn't have been possible without it. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit, just turn to some of the stuff that we're doing within the context that in some ways is super boring. I mean, like what we were seeing before was new ways to diagnose breast cancer or visualize a heart. What I'm showing you is um, in comparison trivial. I am showing you ways to eliminate personal health information that has been perned in at a pixel level into DICOM data. So for those of you who are familiar with that, often you will get an ultra, a person will get an ultrasound and one of the things a little irritating about the ultrasound format for somebody who wants to do research is that instead of nicely putting it around the edge of the image in a bunch of metadata and tags, they actually burn it into the pixels. And if you wanna work with that information, and sometimes they do it on other imaging too, if you wanna work on that information, you better find a way to make sure that you do not have personal health information in it. Because if you do, it's gonna be a problem. And we don't need to talk about why. It's part of the fundamental deal our society has made about how we wanna be treated as patients. So we're gonna respect that. So in order to do that, one of the things that's kind of cool is we took those APIs that AWS had and we said, well, let's kind of flip them around and manipulate them a little bit and mess with them and came up with this tool set that lets you de-identify um, data. It also does something kind of cool, which it does it at scale. So it goes through terabytes or petabytes of data and crawls that data. And that's something that no human can do fast enough. And so in the old days, what you do is you go to the film room, and if you were a researcher, you'd be very excited because you found 100 cases. You'd be super excited. You really wouldn't. It would be hard to find 100 cases. And one of the reasons why we work with so many pediatric hospitals, so many children's hospitals, is kids' conditions, thank God, sort of the same way uh, uh, when my colleague was talking about, hey, it's good that women don't have breast cancer. It's really good that kids don't get sick, too. But when kids do get sick, you work really hard to find other kids who look like your sick kids so you can kind of make some conclusions and try to help that sick person. And so one of the things that we're able to do is crawl unbelievably large amounts of data to spit back information that you're able to use in a way that you couldn't have done before. It would take you forever. And again, going back to the financial services model, why do you think, and sometimes it's used for ill, we all sort of saw Wells Fargo get dragged for doing stuff that wasn't so nice to consumers, but fundamentally, every financial services company, why are they so good at telling you what you want before you know you want it? Why is Amazon so good at doing that, by the way? Because they crawl massive amounts of data and they make conclusions and have insights that are not possible otherwise, and that's what this lets you do. So super cool. And then what does that let you do? It lets you do something kind of neat, which is it lets you to do what we call end-to-end -end trial management workflow. And that workflow is something that today happens all throughout the hospital. So if you're working inside a hospital, there's probably an IRB report, you know, you've got all this stuff going on. If you can start to automate that, you start changing the way people can interact both with each other across institutions 
and across sectors. So we can bring that room of life sciences people closer into this room and you're able to monetize, and I don't mean in a bad way, I mean in a fair way, to be able to get benefit from the data and insights that you have in collaboration with others in the industry. And that's a big deal, hard to do, but this is how you're able to start to do it. And you can see, I don't have any names up there, I've got a bunch of numbers. Now what's kind of cool is all those numbers I can reattach to a name so that literally, and I'm sure we've all been touched by cancer in one way or another. One of my wife's friends, a young woman, oncology patient, fascinating to watch her journey, she's still alive, only because in the course of her disease, new immunotherapy breakthroughs came through that changed how she was treated in the course of her single disease state. That's unheard of, but I'll give you an example because sometimes I do sit in the life sciences room and we were talking to people at Merck, and this isn't anything that's not public, but they said, okay, we have a $5 billion budget for Keytruda. And I thought I misheard them, and I said, wow, it took cost $5 billion to develop Keytruda, one of their big immunotherapy drugs. They said, no, no, you didn't understand what we said. We said we have a $5 billion budget today to optimize new advances on the kinds of other indications we can get from this core research. And they just actually, I didn't know they would do this, but it was published that there's a new finding for a kidney cancer application. So this is the kind of stuff that you can do and that you can bring this capability and can start to partner in an agile way that wasn't possible, and I guarantee you in your current hospital systems is not possible except in a very heavy manual way, which kind of defeats the purpose. And then finally, I've sort of alluded to all of this, but right now, one of the things that's a little bit unusual is we are getting requests constantly for people who want data to be able to develop the kind of algorithms that we've been talking about today. It's a day-to-day it's a, a -day -day thing for us where people come to us and say, we want to buy this information. We need this information. We can't do the research without it. And one of the things that's fascinating is I think there's a lot of ethical questions around how we're going to use our data and who profits and who uses. But right now, I'll tell you, if you are sick and you have the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial, I don't think I've ever seen anyone say, I'm kind of worried how my data will be used. There's two reactions. One is, I would love to get better. And then overwhelmingly, I've sort of seen people say, I kind of understand that there's going to be some benefit down the road, but if you could come up with a drug to spare people from what I'm going through, I, I would think my life had a meaning that was beyond where, where it had been before I had this disease. And so that's what we let you do. And this is something that is happening at every level in the health systems right now. And if you re-platform, you will participate. And you'll participate in a way that is life-saving and pretty inspiring. And you will not uh, probably have felt this energized by anything except if you've been involved in trauma cases where you see instantly things happening like that. This will feel like that because in the space of a time that will make sense to you, you will see a transformation in how patients are treated and what is available for uh, care. So thank you guys very much for your time.